15. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The scripture reading can be found in the few Bibles on page 2 of the Old Testament. You may follow along if you wish. Again, it's Genesis chapter 2, verses 4b through 15. It's on page 2 of the Old Testament. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in the Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium, onyx, stone, gold. The name of the second river is Iman. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we have heard your word, as we read your scripture, and as we as we think about it talk about it, Lord, we pray that it would penetrate into our hearts, or that your word would find a home in our lives that might lead us, guide us to an ever-increasing faith and trust in you. Yes, this in Christ's name. Amen. So for a few weeks now, uh, we're looking a little bit at and what it means to live into our lives, um, into our calling as a people of God. Last week, we looked a little bit at getting this renewed vision, uh, this vision of resurrection, um, that Jesus and his resurrection, it's not just the event that we look back to for our salvation, but it's also the event that we look through to see everything else. It's the lens by which we are to see what God is up to, and what God is doing in the world, and what God's intentions are. Now, as we saw, Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits. It sets the pattern for what is to come, not just for us, uh, but the effects of his resurrection are cosmic, because even creation itself, as we read in Romans last week, is waiting and longing and groaning for redemption. Resurrection is not about escaping from the world God created. It's not about throwing out the old and starting, starting over with something new. Resurrection is about taking the old and raising it, raising it to a, a renewed and restored and even glorified life. This is the vision we talked about last week, and it's the vision that we need to operate from as we continue to look a little bit about what it means, and more specifically, for us to live into our calling. So this week, through this scripture passage, we're going to look. Um, we're going to look a little bit at the idea of vocation. Now we are we are here in New England, um, and New England, uh, part of New England's history involves the Puritans. Um, we read a lot about the Puritans when we read about the history of our nation, especially this part of our nation. Um, some people really like the Puritans, some people really do not like the Puritans, um, but regardless, uh, they did have a lot of good things to say. Uh, and one of the things that was really good that they pointed out and they talked about had to do with calling. The Puritans pointed out that every Christian has three types of calling. You have your ultimate calling, 
You have your common calling, and you have your specific calling. Now, your ultimate calling is what we talk about a lot in church. It's your calling to have a, re a relationship with your Creator. It is the very essence that we often boil the gospel down to, that Jesus came to restore your broken relationship with God. We have this ultimate calling to live a life in relationship with God and praising Him. The English author and theologian Oz Guinness put it like this, First and foremost, we are called to someone, not something or somewhere. We are ultimately called to God Himself through Jesus Christ. That's what the Puritans called our ultimate calling. And then they talked about our common calling, the second type of calling. Now these common callings, these are, these are the commands of Scripture that apply to God's people at all times and all places. Things like love your neighbor as you love yourself, pray for those who persecute you, forgive those who wrong you, the Ten Commandments. We could, we could probably go on and on with those kinds of, of moral commands and injunctions that we find throughout Scripture. This is also something that we talk a lot about in church. And what we as the church, um, for good or bad, depending, um, what we spend a lot of our time talking about in or to the wider culture. And there's a lot to be said about that, but not today. Because these two types of callings, the ultimate calling and the common callings, they're already what we spend a lot of time in church talking about thinking about and studying. But the Puritans, they also, they also talked about a third type of calling, what they called a specific calling, or what we might call vocation. It comes from the Latin word vocare, which means to call. Your vocation is a particular calling for you, a particular person. Those first two types of calling, ultimate calling, common callings, they are kind of, they are callings that are, are said to y'all, to everybody. But this third type of calling is a calling to you, a specific individual. And this gets trickier to talk about. Our ultimate calling and our common callings, they're easier to figure out. They're right there in scripture in black and white, sometimes in red and white, depending on your version of the Bible you're reading. Repent and turn to God. And then live like this, treat people this way, and don't do that. But vocation, specific callings. You're not going to open up the Bible and read where it says, Timmy, go become a doctor. Amy, become an artist. John, become a leader in the school PTA. You're not going to find those words in Scripture. So this is tougher for us to figure out and think about. So what happens is in the church, we don't always address or celebrate vocations. Maybe we should. And so the result is that for most Christians, most of what we do throughout the week is not actually addressed very much in the church. Andy Crouch, uh, who is an editor at Christianity Today magazine, he recounted a time when he was talking to a pastor in Boston. And this pastor told him about a woman in his congregation who was a lawyer for the Environmental Protection Agency. And this woman, this member of his church, this lawyer, she had been vital in getting Boston Harbor at the time, which, which at that time was one of the most uh, polluted waters in the country. She had played a major part in getting it cleaned up. But then the pastor noted, you know, the only time we've actually recognized her in church was for her role in teaching second grade Sunday school. And of course, we absolutely should celebrate Sunday school teachers and the hours and volunteering that they do. But why did we never celebrate her incredible contribution to our city, our whole city, as a Christian, taking care of God's creation? See, this lawyer was living into her vocation throughout the week, her specific calling by God, and the church limited itself to speaking about and celebrating only what she did on Sundays, and not what she was doing the vast majority of her life. 
which was actually when she was fulfilling her vocation. And that, again, is not to discount the profound importance of what goes on on Sundays and, and how important it is to invest and volunteer and give time to the church. But if God is calling us to live full, whole lives as Christians, you know, by not speaking to the other six days of the week, we are missing out. And even when the church does speak to those other days, the message is often something along the lines of, to quote Dorothy Sayers, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and come to church on Sundays. We might also add that if you really want to be spiritual on your job, maybe you can start a Bible study or something like that. And again, those are all good things that need to be said. But I want to suggest this morning, with that vision of resurrection from last week before us, I want to suggest that Scripture, and therefore the church, has much more to say about vocation than just that. Dorothy Sayers goes on to say, what the church should be telling this carpenter is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him and his vocation is that he should make good tables. And that brings us to this morning's passage from Genesis. In Genesis 2, God made man from the dust of the ground, breathed into him the breath of life so that he became a living, breathing, living being. And then God planted a garden. Now a garden is different than a wilderness. A flower garden, for example, and a field of wildflowers, they are two very different things. Both may be beautiful, but one is intentional. One is planned. One is worked and organized. One requires care and supervision and upkeep to bring about the intended result. And in the ancient Near East, the context of those who would first be reading this account from Genesis, a garden was a very limited space. The word for garden is also a word for enclosure. Gardens had walls. So God is making this very intentional, limited space requires work. God puts man into this garden, and then out of the ground, God makes to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And there's also these two other special trees that are there, and there's water that is flowing from Eden into the garden. The garden is not Eden, but it's in this larger area called Eden. It's an intentional space within Eden. And then verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. Why? To till it and keep it. Here's the first thing to take away from this. This is Genesis 2. We haven't gotten to Genesis 3 yet. Sin has not entered the picture. Everything is still how God intended and set things up. And there is work that needs doing. Work in and of itself, is not a part of the curse of Genesis 3. It is a part of the original blessing of life and creation. Work is a part of what God has called very good. God's intention from the beginning was that humanity would be placed in the garden to till it and to keep it. God's intention is that we would have work to do, cultivating what God had made. If we back up a little bit to the end of Genesis 1 and that account of God creating man and woman in his image, they are told also to fill the earth and subdue it, having dominion over it. This is humanity's mandate from God from the very beginning, to bear the image of God, working and tilling the garden, and then to expand it, to go out to fill the earth, to subdue it. Not in the sense of beating it down and exploiting it, but subduing it in the sense of cultivating it. That's how you make a garden. You cultivate it. You don't come in and beat it down. You work in it and through it to bring about the desired result. That was the mandate given to humanity, to be the image of God in the world, to follow the pattern set by God when he created. 
created this garden to grow and cultivate it, to be a steward of what God has created, with the gifts that God has given, following the purpose God has intended. That's who we are made to be. That's what it means to be in the image of God. That's the first thing to notice about what's going on here. Work is there from the beginning. And the second thing is this. There are three aspects to the garden that God created. First, the garden is a place of order. That's a key difference between a garden and a wilderness, as we mentioned just a minute ago. Gardens are intentional. And there is a, there are order, there's an order to them. God is bringing about order all throughout his creative acts. Second, this garden is a place of beauty. Notice this. What does it say about the trees that God causes to, to grow? Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. There is beauty here in this garden. There are things to enjoy in the garden simply because they are enjoyable. They are beautiful. This is an important aspect of this garden that God creates. And third, this garden is a place of abundance. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. All sorts of trees to eat from. There's an abundance of water flowing with these rivers. And there's even a tree of life there. There is abundance in this garden. And just as an aside, because I am married to an artist, I just want to say it is, it is interesting to me that the beauty of the trees is mentioned before their productivity. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But I think that's worth thinking about when we think about how we go about living our lives and what is important. So this garden that God created is a place, it's a place of order and of beauty and of abundance. And the intention was for humanity to keep cultivating this garden and to go from there and continue cultivating all the earth to be the image of God in the world is to join him in his creative work. Now we know what happens in Genesis 3. Sin enters in, we make bad decisions, and the effects of our sin, they ripple out, even the ground becomes cursed. Work becomes mixed, it becomes frustrated at times, it becomes hard. Even so, the fact remains that work itself, this calling to cultivate a world of order and beauty and abundance, is a part of God's intention and His plan for us as His image bearers from the beginning. This is the framework that I think helps us to get a deeper view of vocation, or, or what the Puritans call our specific callings. Because to work, is a good thing. And let me just make sure I say this. By work, I don't just mean something that you're getting paid to do. What I really mean is something that you're doing. Something you're spending your time and energy and effort on. It could be a job, but it could also be a hobby. It could be a volunteer position. It could be your social interactions within your community. That could be your work, your calling, your vocation. It is simply, it is cultivating, in whatever capacity you are given, given, it is cultivating a world of order and beauty and abundance. And that is, as we see here in Genesis, that is a good and holy calling in and of itself. Especially when we view it through our lens of resurrection that we talked about last week. Because remember, resurrection is not about discarding or replacing. It is about God raising and renewing. It is about God taking what is there and fulfilling it, bringing about its full, ultimate, and redeemed expression. If we, if we are a people of the resurrection, and if this world that we live in is the world created by God that will also be renewed and redeemed, then the work that we do now in the world, what we are cultivating, it will be a part of that renewed heaven and earth. It will be a part of the full realization of the kingdom of God. 
just listen to the promise that we find at the end of Revelation 21. We started at the beginning of the Bible, and we're going to jump right to the end now. Revelation 21. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city, of, the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. This final vision of the new heavens and the new earth, this holy city that has come down out of heaven, the garden has now become a city here. The kings of the earth, they bring into it their glory. People are bringing in the glory and honor of the nations. All the good things that make up the different cultures of the nations, they come into it and they become caught up in this final, redeemed, holy city. And that means that the work, the cultivating that goes on in those nations and cultures to make them what they are, this cultivating of the culture, it matters. And it matters eternally. In light of the resurrection, this is how we need to begin to think of our work, of our vocations, of what we do, what we are called to do throughout the week. I certainly can't stand up here and say what your specific calling is, or what the time frame is of any particular calling that you have. That can only be discerned in light of our ultimate calling, as we live in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It can only be discerned by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. But what I can say, because this is what Scripture says, is that whatever your work is, it matters. What I can say, again, because this is what Scripture says, is that your vocation, your specific calling, it will take, it will take part in cultivating a world of order and beauty and abundance. And in light of the resurrection, the effects of that work, they will carry on somehow and in some way. They will carry on into eternity. And they will be a part of the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Just as some examples of how to start thinking about vocation. If you are an artist of any kind, or if you're in, in the entertainment industry, you are working to cultivate beauty and enjoyment in the world. And that is a good and holy thing. If you are a computer programmer, you are helping to cultivate order and even abundance in the life of those around you. That is a good and holy thing. If you work in insurance, you are enabling people to live more abundantly. That is a good and holy thing. If you clean things, again, you are working to cultivate order, beauty, and abundance in the world. Teaching, the same thing. If you maintain a home, goodness, you are definitely working and working to cultivate order, beauty, and abundance, aren't you? If you are able to invest time and energy into relationships in your community, you are working to help cultivate order, beauty, and abundance within your community and within the lives of the people in your community. If you are volunteering for organizations, you are working cultivate order, beauty, and abundance in the world. Family, these are vocations, and they are good and holy things. If you are a student, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, whatever, those of you who just started back to school this past week, at least part of your vocation at this time in your life is your education. Because the work that you do as part of your education, it is again aimed at helping you to cultivate your life and the world around you with order, beauty, and abundance. And I bet those of you in school, you have opportunities to help others in your school. You're around people all the time. You have great opportunities to invest in the lives of your fellow students and even your teachers. This week, think about how you can help bring these good things to your school, your job, or your communities, and the people.
people that are there. The point is this. That vision that we talked about last week, that gives us these corrective lenses to start to see the world as God sees it and as God intends, they help us to see the truth about what most of us do most of the time. Again, I can't say for sure that what you are doing is your specific calling or not. What I can say is that if what you are working at, what you are doing in your life, if it helps cultivate a garden, this place of order, and beauty, and abundance, any combination of those things, that should be seen as a good, even holy calling. Some people may be called into specific church work. But as Dallas Willard, who is a great Christian philosopher and theologian, as he points out, uh, he points out that we should not auto that should not automatically be the default vocation for holy people. Instead, holy people, he says, holy people must take up holy orders in farming, industry, law, education, banking, and so on, with the same zeal previously given to evangelism or to pastoral and missionary work. And that's not to discount any of those things, evangelism, pastoral work, missionary work, that kind of stuff. It's not to discount it, but it's to say we all have this holy vocation before us. We should approach them with the same zeal that we do and we expect in the church. It's true, some Christians are called very specifically to be professional Christians. But most of us are not. And that is a good thing. Because God's redemptive work, it reaches far wider than the walls of this church. It reaches far wider than we are sometimes tempted to think. God is interested in the redemption, not just of people, but also of the world and the nations and their cultures and all that goes into those things. God is interested in the resurrection and the redemption of life of cultivating the world he created. And through Jesus Christ, how awesome is this? Through Jesus Christ, God is interested in you and I being a part of that. Through Jesus Christ, God is redeeming and renewing in us the image of God we were created to carry out into the world, an image that follows after its creator, cultivating his creation with order, beauty, and abundance as he intended from the beginning. We are not all called to church vocations, but all of us, all of us who have put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, all of us are called to holy and sacred vocations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you might help us to have a renewed sense of vocation. By your Spirit, guide and lead us to the places you have called us to be. Give us a vision to see our places of employment, our schools, our hobbies, our interactions with our neighbors. Lord, give us eyes to see our places in our community as a good and holy vocation. That through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we may take part in the cultivating of your promised kingdom. Amen.